yeah, we're, we'll we're, understand we're, each other we're, fine. We're totally fine. That's fine, but uh, thank you very much uh, for coming on. I know everybody is busy. Uh, everybody has families, they've got life, we've all got music. Uh, so I do appreciate you taking the time uh, to come on and speak to myself. Uh, so we're going to talk about all things music. Nice. And we will talk about the band as well. But um, first of all, how are the two of you doing? How are you? Everything is great. Thank you for inviting us. We're super grateful. I know it's um, uh, festive uh, times over here, but we're totally um, on to speak to you and we're grateful really, yeah. Yeah, we're very, very, we appreciate that uh, you, you having this, uh, this episode fine. with us. That's fine. So what we will do is we will go right back to the very beginning. And if you could each just uh, tell me where are you originally from? All right. Yeah. Uh, so the story is we started the project in our hometown, that is Caracas, uh, Venezuela. Venezuela. Um, but actually, Carlos is Colombian as well. So when things got really uh, complicated in our home country, as you probably know, because it is, it's an ongoing situation uh, for so many years, so we basically um, left the country. Yeah, we moved here in Bogotá. We Colombia. moved to Colombia and restarted the project here. Right. So the project as a project, it began in, in Caracas, but as a band, as a four piece, as a five piece, we sometimes were, uh, it's really from, from Colombia. So we, we, we kind of restarted everything and we have, we have to find the, the, the new members. Yeah. And and it was hard, but we are finally getting there again. The pandemic hit us really hard, yeah. and um, it Everyone. was tough. But we 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 got back on track, fortunately. Yeah. So so going back to when the two of you were were young, were both of you into music when you were small, when you were children? Yeah. Yeah, we, we, we were into music. Um, I remember the first instrument I had uh, was a cuatro. A cuatro is a, a, um, it's, it's a like, traditional instrument. It's similar to the ukulele. It's uh, cuatro, in, yeah. cuatro in Spanish means four, four because it has four strings. four strings and it's pretty similar to an ukulele. It's like the, the same... Uh, it's like the flute in Europe, and it's the cuatro in, in, in Venezuela. It's the first instrument you get when you're at school, you start learning that. It was the first instrument I, I played, really boring, didn't like it. <laughs> um, I wanted to play the drums, but you yep. know, my, my mom was like, no, it's too loud, you cannot do that. Yep. So guitar it is. Guitar is fine. It's similar to the cuatro, you can have that. Yeah. And that's and what? what I ended up playing, yeah. What about yourself, Carlos? What was your first instrument? Well, my first instrument, uh, I started studying music when I was six years. My first instrument was actually a uh, marimba, you know, a steel marimba. Uh, but then I got interested in piano, so I took piano lessons since I was six years old until I was 13 years old. Uh, but then, but back then, uh, my mom brought, uh, bought me a keyboard to practice, so I didn't, I never had a real piano back at home, so I always had this keyboard and well, but in my, in my free time I used to, you know, explore sounds, I like how different, uh, different things sound. Uh, I don't know, I started experimenting with pads, electric pianos, organs, and uh, when I was 17, uh, after I graduated high school, I, I started studying music production, and actually I, I, I earned a degree in music production in an American university. So yeah, since then uh, I have been a keyboard player. Uh, I n still today I don't have my own piano, I hope one day have a real piano at home. So when I speak to a lot of people, and they're talking about growing up, a lot of people are influenced, their musical influences originally come from their parents, so they, they listen yeah. to what parents are listening to, 
and then at some point, normally when they're when they when they become a teenager, they discover their own music that, that they enjoy. What was the first bands that you discovered that you enjoyed? Oh, that's hard. Um, so I had an emo face. <laughs> I think every yeah, every everyone had, an emo everyone had an emo face. Obviously, if you're a millennial, you probably had an emo face. Um, I really listened to the music my mom listened. So my mom was into. Celine Dion and that kind of stuff, you know. I still listen to that music. I, yep. it, 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 it makes me feel close to my mom. But then I, I think the first heavy band with a female vocal I um, encountered was Nightwish. Right. Um, it blew my mind. I didn't know a, a woman in front of a band could sing like that. Mm -hmm. And then I, I, I went into that emo god phase, so Evanescence, Lacura Coil, you know, all that stuff. When I met Carlos, he was into prog. I was, I was not really a prog head, you know. And he was like, yeah, Dream Theater, that's my favorite band, you know, you have to listen to them. He was I, I like, was 17 yeah. in my <laughs> And he was like, DVDs, CDs, and he was like, you have to listen to them. I really, that was the first modern-ish a uh, prog I, I listened to and I fell in love with, with the, the musicianship of these guys. Yep. So it was like kind of that path for me. Yeah, for me it's, it's funny because my father actually listened to uh, progressive rock all his entire life. He has a huge collection of progressive rock vinyls, uh, CDs. So back when I was a kid, uh, we used to we used to go on holidays to my hometown. My hometown was not Caracas. It was it was a seven hour car trip. <coughs> and well, my my father uh, usually turned his cities and it was Genesis, Pink Floyd, King Crimson. And yeah, that, that kind of, I, I remember one of my favorite that my dad listened to was Rush. That really blew my mind. And when I was a teenager, I remember uh, looking into my brother's CDs, and I noticed he had uh, Green Day and Linkin Park back in 2001. So, and then I become a huge Linkin Park fan. Yeah, I had like this not emo, but maybe got a uh, face of an essence. Well, my first city that I brought, I bought myself with my own money was Met Meteora by Linkin Park. Right. And then it grew to other genres. Uh, yes, when I was finishing high school, a lot of my friends were listening to Dream Theater. So uh, yeah, I got hooked on and then I was turning into, I don't know, Porcupine Tree, uh, uh, Scenic, uh, I don't know, Steven Wilson solo. Uh, actually, one of my favorite uh, bands right now is Porcupine Tree. Do, do you both remember the first ever concert that you attended? <laughs> uh, You're putting me in the spot here. If I say the first concert, <laughs> and no, every, I'm, I'm going to get haters I don't, I don't want. I'm gonna tell you the first concert I'm proud of sharing. Okay. Um, it was probably it was probably Epica. I, I went to an Epica concert that was really a mess. The Booker didn't um, the Venezuelan Booker didn't pay the guys. Um, yeah, they were it was an awful in a an awful neighborhood. It was an awful experience for them. Amazing for us, the fans, but it was awful for them. I, I remember I interviewed Mark Janssen, the, the guitar player, when I was in this, I had a radio show as well at, right. that, at the time. And he was like, no, Caracas was a mess. They didn't pay us, but we, we still played, but it was cool, but it was awful. We're never coming back. And not because of you guys, because of the promoters. Yeah. It was a mess, but and it was an awesome concert. In, indeed, they, they never came they back. They never came back, yeah. Uh, as for me, my first concert, and I would say say it proudly because it <laughs> has some haters, it was a, it was a folk metal uh, band from Spain called Mago de Oz, uh, oh. like Wizard of Oz in, uh, in English. Uh, funny, uh, 
the, the amount of people that I ask that question and they do exactly what you just done, Annie, which was, <laughs> did I tell them the first concert or did I tell them the one that I'm proudest of? <laughs> uh, after my first one, yeah, I'm proud to say that uh, I know it has a lot of haters. I love uh, their music back then, not so much right now. My second concert was Tatuarius from Finland. Right. And then I had the honor to see uh, Motorhead really, really close to Lemmy. Right, okay, that's that's pretty cool. Yeah, yeah, it was pretty cool. Those were my first concerts on my own. Like, I was yeah. in my teens and I bought tickets by my own. The, the concerts that I really liked. I think I think um, Motorhead was one of those bands that I never managed to get to see. Ah, oh, that's so bad. And uh, it was just never at the right... Whenever they were playing here in Glasgow, it was at the wrong time that I couldn't attend it. And it's uh, it's annoying, but it, I've managed to see pretty much everybody else that I've wanted to see up to this point. But that was the one. Lucky you. Yeah. What, lucky, you. lucky you. Yeah, but uh, obviously being in Scotland, there's so many bands come through on their tour cycle. It, it's, it is relatively easy to go. The only thing you need to think about now is the, the price of tickets is so. Is so it's high. high. It's high, yeah. Yeah, it's really. I think that probably the same everywhere. Um, unfortunately, that's just the world that we live in. Is that the prices keep going up and up? Yeah, but, um, yeah it's complicated. It's a complicated business, you know. Um, yeah. I remember the um, uh, Robert Smith uh, being really vocal about this, about how can we get closer to fans, young fans, and don't have money to attend to these super VIP experience, close-up uh, experiences, and you're kind of driving them away from the from the real thing, you know? They, they go and listen in Spotify. It's easier, it's cheaper. Uh, it, it's, it's not... It's, that it's, weird. it's weird because when I do these podcasts, when I have people um, face-to-face, uh, I've got a, like a a man cave, like an office that I do it in, <laughs> and, and, and on, the, on the wall next to it is all the old uh, ticket stubs from concerts that I've attended, and um, it's funny because when you look back at the prices of tickets, yeah. you know, when, for example, when I, yeah, 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 we do the uh, same. I, I have my collection right here, uh, yeah. here in my studio. For example, this is the first Dream Theater ticket I went to. It was in the city of Valencia in Venezuela. Yeah. Uh, oh, here is Metallica. Metallica, Metallica He's back wearing in out. 2010. Iron Maiden also as well. Yeah. So it's uh, fun. This is the band I told you, Magrile Ross. All right. Yeah. <laughs> It's funny because I'm not sure, obviously, of the, the, the price difference with regard to the money they use, but the first time I saw Metallica, the ticket was £19.99. Okay. The last time I saw them, it was £100. Wow. So it was a massive difference, but I, I did see them on the Death Magnetic Tour, the same tour that you saw them on, yeah, I, yeah. The first time I saw them was a way back in 1996. Wow. Do you remember I, the price back then? It was £19.99. Okay, in 96? Yeah. Oh. Yeah. And over each time they come to Scotland, they'll come to Scotland once every 10 years, maybe. And <laughs> the price keeps going up and up. And uh, Iron Maiden are not too, they're not as bad. But um, I have saw them probably seven or eight times now, and the, the last few times the ticket price has been the same, which is really good, but um, it's still expensive. Yeah, but, yeah. I, I think one really good thing about being a prog fan is that when our favorite bands come to Colombia, which is extremely rare, yeah. yeah. it, generally the tickets are relatively they are low. Affordable, yeah. yeah, yeah, they're really affordable. For example, we saw Riverside, uh, one of our favorite bands from Poland, 
We saw him last week, uh, or two weeks ago, I don't remember. And ticket was like, I don't know. Like $30. $30, probably, yeah. yeah. But, yeah, I mean, it's here, there, there's still a lot of really good bands that you can go and see that are probably, that they are famous, but they're, they're, they're smaller bands. So they will maybe sell out a 3,000 seat place. But for the big bands like Metallica and Iron Maiden that are selling out 15,000, you have got to, to pay big money to, to go and see them. But uh, as long as you put the money aside, you can make sure that you save up for it and, and you can afford it. It's not too bad. And you prefer the, the smaller venues or the big? Small. Small. Yeah, I prefer yeah, the small yeah, ones. We prefer small I, ones. I, I think I've never been to a concert huge in, in a huge stadium. Um, I don't think if I, after all these years, I would enjoy. No, I, I'm not yeah. used to watch my favorite musicians like ants, like little ants in a big screen. I'm so used to, to see them so close up. I don't know if I would feel um, comfortable or excited. I don't know. It, it is still a very, it's still a good experience. However, it is exactly what you've said, is that they look like ants on the stage. Yeah. They yeah. tend yeah. to watch the screen, and then you're thinking, I could be sat at home watching this on television. Yeah, yeah, yeah. When it's the smaller place, even if you're at the back, you've still got a good view. Yeah. You know, it's more intimate, but in a good way. Um, but if, see if we fast forward. Uh, Argovia, the band, I, I know that you started in 2013, so just over 10 years ago. And you've done a, a homemade EP, um, which was Last Letters, um, which was quite successful. And you've then done an album, Distant uh, Present. Now, did that come out in 2020? No, no that's 2017. 2017, yeah. Right. And in between, so, so from 2013 up to 2020, were you just writing songs and performing gigs? <laughs> we were trying to, to leave Venezuela. It's sad to say, but um, this migration process was really um, hard for us. Uh, we, have, we still have family there. We have to leave um, in the pursuit of a better life, really. So we, we had to put on hold the project. It was Carlos and I in a little room just playing around. We, we didn't want it to do something too serious. Um, but when we put out the music, it really got to a lot of people. And we thought, like, wow, you, this, this could be a, a, a serious project, you know, yeah, a serious side project. And the band could never really work. Back then, it was, it was hard. There was a, 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 a huge economic crisis yeah so we we did one show in caracas and that was it right so we left uh we put on hold we we, we put the project on hold and then in bogota we were like we we have to settle down first and then figure out what to do so we started working on the music some songs we had um uh, written before and uh, moving to bogota uh, some some songs were uh, bringing this new face, um, but then we were like, should we find the the new members? Should we keep doing our thing in our in our room, like yeah. with the same intimate uh, collaboration we did uh, um, for we, last We letters? ended up doing a mix of, a mix both. of both. Like yeah. we we found a drummer and a guitar player, uh, but still we did all in my uh, in my room back at my parents' home. And we didn't, we didn't actually record it real drums, it was uh, digital. Right. But the rest of them, it was all recorded by me. But... And then when we were like, this album is doing good, it's, um, let's do something more professional, let's take the project to the next level, the pandemic hit. Well, before so, that, we, we actually well, we did toured. a tour. We, we, we did Colombia. a tour here was, in Colombia. Nice. We yeah. were to uh, like a five town tour. It was minimal, but it was really great. Yeah, it was good. Yeah. But yeah, then the pandemic hit. Uh, and we had to find 
good paying jobs <laughs> to, to keep supporting the hobby uh, that it's music right now because it's it's not our full time jobs. Yeah, we um, that's, thankfully so we, we already had the jobs. Yeah, yeah. So we didn't have like a really bad uh, financial situation and pandemic. Yeah. We were really good, but then again, the, the project we did we had to pause it because. Well, everybody, everybody was passing yeah. their, their yeah, point. of course. Yeah. So, going back to to the band, how do you how do you go about writing a song? What what is your method to write a song? This is a great for question. Annie is walking the dog. <laughs> I just take the dog out, and the dog, <laughs> it's magical. It's the same thing with the other the the previous dog we had. Uh, I just take a walk with him and everything just pops in my head. I come back, um, record a little note in my phone, then yeah. go to Logic Pro, MIDI, everything, and then take the real instruments and play around the idea. If I think the idea is good, I share it with Carlos. He does the same. I don't know. He, he's going to tell you right now how. <laughs> well, it's pretty similar. It can... It but can no yeah. Well, sometimes it's with the dog, but yeah, it could hit from everywhere, uh, anywhere that, I don't know, I suddenly think about a melodic line, uh, a complex time signature that really sticks to my head. I also do the recorded on my phone, on a voice note, and yeah, then I try to replicate that idea into my into my computer I turn on logic I try to get in as close to that as I can and then what I like to do is to bring it to if I think it's good I bring it to Annie and I bring it with an open mind that maybe this song will <laughs> change. Gonna rip this song yeah yeah the, the, <laughs> she will rip this because that's what actually happens that it rips it in a very good way, like it turns yeah. out in a really good thing. So that's actually how both of us work. And for our, I think maybe you're going to ask this, but after, after doing what we call uh, like a draft, like a draft needed the most easiest way to do it, then we discussed it with, with, the with the other musicians and we started to give it life. Yeah. Yeah. It is amazing how people can be inspired to write a song. And, and I've spoke a lot about this to other people. That, um, I mean, I, I play guitar, I sing, and the amount of times I can be listening to a song and there might be a little tiny bit in the song, it might be something that's sang, it might be something on the guitar, but it, it, that one little bit can inspire me to then go and write an entire new song. And the song that I write, it doesn't sound like the other song, it's, it's got nothing related to the other song, but that song inspired me to then write another song. And a lot of people are the same, you might, be you're watching a film, a movie, on the TV, and the subject matter might trigger something in your head. You might be reading a book, and there's a line in the book that just inspires you. Um, everybody is different, and that's why it's quite fascinating to hear different people describe how they write a song. But uh, I think about the process gets harder the more music you put out, because you're always kind of competing against yourself, yep. you know, kind of trying to better yourself. So what we are, we are low-key working on new music because we don't want to wait too long. Uh, it's an EP, it's short. Uh, yep. We would like to put out music as soon as we can. And we had like the blank page staring at us like, <laughs> what? what's next? Can you yep. write something better than what's already been put out? And you, you're kind of, you have this pressure, even if we don't have a record label, this is not our full-time job. Um, you still have a pressure on yourself to, to better yourself, to not let anyone down. And, and it's harder to find inspiration in a calm, 
safe and, and cool environment. I think yeah. that's challenging. It's interest, interesting and challenging at the same time. Obviously, we've, we've spoke about the music, but who writes the lyrics, the words for the songs? I write the lyrics, yeah. And do you see if I was to, you know, obviously, uh, if you were to write, write it down in English and I was to read it <laughs> without hearing the music, would it make sense as in, would it be obvious what you're singing about or a little bit more mysterious? Oh, that's a good question. I don't think it would sound the same. I don't know, I'm not, I'm not sure. Um, I've, I'm not good writing in Spanish. This is weird for me to say, you know, it's my yeah. native language. Um, but I don't really listen to that much music in Spanish, so I think I'm heavily influenced by, um, I think even British music, um, more so than, than American. Um, it's easier, I don't know, I think it's, the words are better the, sounding. I think um, with the yeah. Spanish is that Spanish has a lot of types of verbs that yeah. the English <laughs> language oh, but, doesn't have. But I don't think it's about it's, that, uh, I think it's about... Um, but generally the people that I've spoken about writing lyrics uh, many of, of or many of those were Latino or from Latin America. Many of them uh, actually they say they prefer to write in English because it's kind of easier to sing. All it right. Okay. I don't think I I don't know if I agree. I don't know if I agree. I think it's about um, the music you're influenced to. I think if you listen to a lot of French music and you're able to uh, speak French. Properly, like you. you could, but I don't listen to that much French music. But you could, you could write in French. It would feel like like home for you. Uh, I don't listen to a lot of of Latin music. Uh, I think it's a flaw. <laughs> <laughs> it's a flaw because uh, you're you're weird here if you don't like salsa, merengue, whatever, um, yeah, reggaeton. Um, it's weird. But I feel close to home when I listen to music in English. It's like it hits, it hits something, and I find it easier to express myself. I'm trying to change that, to be more open, and maybe some Spanish, some English, but I, I still prefer writing in English, yeah. It's funny, me. I've just thought of, thought of this whilst asking you the question. My sister's husband is a singer, and his first language is French, and his second language is English, so I should probably ask him. You should. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, what, you should. What one do you find easier because he, he has done both? So it's an interesting thing to think about. But um, another question for you. So the way that people get music nowadays, you, you can download music, you can stream it, you can access it on like YouTube and uh, online. Is artwork still important when you, for example, release an album? So when I was younger, I would go to a music shop and I would look through the CDs and there would be times where I would purchase an album and I had never heard of the band, but, <laughs> but I purchased it because I liked the album cover. Yeah, it's so it wasn't it was important. It, it helped to sell the music, but nowadays you don't get a lot of music shops anymore. So, is artwork still important? Do you think? I think so. It's funny because we had this conversation recently with my father, who's <laughs> uh, who is pretty old school He's when really it comes to listening to music. He still has vinyls. Uh, he was pretty much into, he actually lived in England, we actually lived in England when I was a baby, and one of his favorite places was in Covent Garden in London, yep. where, where there was this uh, record store that he told me about, and it was a whole culture, a whole hobby to just go there, browse uh, around, and maybe you end up buying a, a, 
uh, buying a CD or vinyl just because of how it looked. Yeah. I read it about uh, in a book by Stephen Wilson, who is British, the the guitarist and singer from Porcupine Tree, that he he still does that. He goes to his record favorite record store, and when he was little, he uh, he pretty much bought music based on what it looked like. So I think it's still it is still relevant. But I think it's relevant for the for different reasons. Perhaps mm, not in the sense that you're going to go to a record shop and and find something interesting and just <coughs> take it home and see. Well, this was really this wasn't really good, but it looked nice. Yeah. Uh, it has a collection value still. If you if you buy something physical and the art sucks <laughs> it's not that nice you know it's not that nice you don't have it in your studio you know displayed for everyone to see uh, but if you're I, I recently I'm a designer no yes you know so I, I, I tend to pay attention to this yeah. and I, I was uh, scrolling past Spotify and if the artwork is good even if it's a thumbnail really really small there are some artworks that just pop pop to the eye you know it's yeah. like yeah this is this is interesting perhaps it's not that interesting to open up and like really see the details but it helps it helps to give like a body to your songs like a physical body yeah if it's i think an artwork is yeah. also an extension yeah. of of the music it's like yeah. a physical representation of yeah the it's like the feel the look so at you you have to look, you have to sound nice and look nice as well. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I completely agree, but um, I, I think maybe it also depends on what age you are. So I, I because of when I was brought up, you still would purchase things on how it looked even. Whereas my daughter, you know, <laughs> is not used to going to a music shop and looking through CDs. So she would only ever get something online. So it might depend on what age you are, uh, but I, I, like, I like the artwork. I completely agree that it's, it still represents the band and the product and the music. And it ve it's very important, I think. Yeah. But, yeah, but we have been uh, extremely... Um, and shall we say it, we've been very serious up to this point. So before we finish, I'm going to ask you some fun questions. All right, okay. bring it on. Okay. So okay. imagine that you could go back in time. What, and you could go anywhere in the world and there was no ticket price. What was would be the one concert that you wish that you could have attended and witnessed? Ooh, that's a that, that's a really tough one. Tough one. Uh, ladies first. Okay, <laughs> this is hard. I would have loved uh, watching. I don't know if if it's a concert specifically, but I would have loved to listen to or watch live uh, the Cranberries when they blew up. I think right. they're one of my favorite bands. Okay. Uh, I still get emotional whenever I listen to Dolores sing. Um, mm. I think any the Cranberries concert from the 90s, early 2000s, yeah. I would have loved, yeah. Uh, I would have loved to see Linkin Park back in their 2000s era, like with Hybrid Theory and Link, uh, Meteora Tours. Like the Meteora Tours specifically, because my first uh, live DVD that I bought uh, was one from Linkin Park live in Texas. Okay, right. Next question. Now, the, between the two of you, you you play a lot of different musical instruments. But for each of you, is there a, a musical instrument you don't play that you wish that you could play? Yes, uh, wind instrument, a brass instrument. Uh, neither of us can play like a flute or a saxophone. We actually have a thing with the saxophones that we have tried many times to have. Uh, we're still trying. We're, yeah, we're saxophone players on one of our songs, and 
And last time we tried, uh, time ran out on, on us, so <laughs> it was a real shame. But yeah, we cannot play like wind instruments. So, uh, um... But pick one, pick one. Hmm? Pick an instrument you need. You think yeah, yeah, sa- I'll, 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 I'll do a saxophone. I'll do a saxophone, okay. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. I, I would have loved to play the cello, I think. Right. The cello. But what, what, I don't know why this is. But um, you, your episode that we're doing just now is the 23rd episode I've done. Okay. I, when I've asked that question to other people, the most common instrument that people wish they could play was the saxophone, which I was... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but yeah. It's a really nice it, instrument. Everybody thinks the same. And uh, so another question for you. We know that there is millions and millions of really excellent songs that have been recorded over the years. What's the one song for each of you that you wish you could have been in the recording studio to witness the band recording the song? This is hard. <laughs> can I can I answer yeah, with know. an album instead of a song because <laughs> I I I am the kind of guy that like to hear the whole album. Yeah. Well, I think well I get one that it's really I I would have I would have loved to see the recording and the whole production of Octavarium by Dream Theater. Right. Okay. Classic. Yeah. And- I'm gonna pick a really recent song. Um, oh. That it's a song that I listen to almost every day. I'm really obsessed with this one. Oh. And um, I don't know if you're familiar with Caligula's Horse. No. It's a prog metal uh, Australian oh, band. Yeah, of course. Sure. And I, it resonates with me because they had a big hiatus. You know, they they stopped doing music. They didn't even know if they were going to come back. And they were like a little bit broken <laughs> inside, um, and that 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 kind of happened to us, you know. Uh, we we've had a ten-year career, but it's not really a ten-year career, non-stop. That we've really put up the work and consistently working on it. So uh, it's a ten fake, uh, <laughs> fake years. It goes by moments. Yeah, it's like some some moments. Uh, I I don't regret that. The, there were times where I was like, you know, there, there was frustration about this. But anyway, to, to get to the point. Um, the song. They put out the song Mute. It's the last song of the latest album they, they put out. And the song is about that. It's about the struggle of finding love for music again. Um, I recently saw a video of them explaining like the meaning of the song. I was like, ah, this is why this song is so important for me. It's like, yeah, I get, I get the feeling, I get you. Um, I think it's a super emotional song. So I, I think that the textures, different um, tones, like the euphoria, but the sadness, it's like so perfectly Produce. I would have loved to to witness that. I think it's an amazing song. You should definitely I'll, check it out. Yeah, I'll check it out afterwards, definitely. And uh, the very last question for the two of you. So in America, they have Mount Rushmore with the, the four presidents' uh, faces. So who is each of yours Mount Rushmore for music? <laughs> oh. Who is the four musicians or bands that t- for each of you, they are perfect. You're, you're not gonna believe me, but I was thinking about that in these days, these recent days. Uh, for me, it would be uh, Steven Wilson from Porcupine Tree, uh, Jordan Rudis from Dream Theater, uh, Mikko Ackerfeld from Opeth, Yep. And wow, well, a third, uh, fourth one, it's kind of difficult. Uh, yeah, yeah, Derek Shirinian, that it was, it also played in, on Dream Theater and Sons of Apollo. Yeah. Honey? Gosh, this is hard. Um, 
think it would be Steven Wilson. I, I really love Steven as a musician. Um, it has to be Dolores, Dolores O'Riordan from the Cranberries. Um, this is really hard. <laughs> um, I don't know. Jordan's? No. Oh, I think my Michael Ackerfeld as well from Opeth. Opeth is oof. There's just so many. Uh, I'm missing one. I don't know who to put there. Anneke. Put yourself. I don't know. I'm gonna I'm gonna pick Anneke from The Gathering. Right. Okay. The singer. Yeah. This uh, this is my Mount Rushmore. It's me. Male uh, and female, you know. Yeah, yeah. I know. I know yeah, you yeah, are all guys with guys, bros, be bros, and all that stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Ari Carlos, it has been a pleasure uh, speaking to you, and uh, I'll keep following you on social media. And I wish you all the luck in the future with the music, and uh, keep in touch with us as well. And uh, I'll speak to you later on. Thank you, Ian. We, Thank you so much for having us. Really, really, Bye. really grateful with you, Ian. Thank you very much. Bye. Cheers, guys. Bye. Thank you. See, See you. Later. Cheers. <laughs>